I come from. I got involved. I came home from college, and I had a job with a really fancy law firm out of law school. And my city is the only city in America occupied by the National Guard, the military, for 10 months when Dr. King was shot. And I had this fancy job, a kid coming from a, from a lower middle income household. I quit and became a public defender. And I stayed in that community. I was the only guy when I was in high school. I had a job, a country club kind of job with a, at a swimming pool. I was the only white employee in the East Side because I wanted to work in the projects, because I wanted to understand. That's how I got involved in politics. That's what this is all about for me. It's about equality. It's about dignity. It's about treating people with respect. Why does he have to yell all of this at Charlemagne? Like that's the, this whole interview is every time Charlemagne asks a question, instead of just saying, "Hey, you know, um, my my background is uh, coming from a district that has a, a large percentage of black people, and uh, you know, I I volunteer to go work in a black community," you could just say that and say he's like, "Look at this shit." Look at the shit that I, how dare you? How dare you? Get, like, it's, it's so wild to me. And I got to give Charlemagne a lot of credit because he is just like super fucking poised. And he's just like, yeah, I hear, I, I hear you. I hear you old white man. <laughs> Look, everything that he's talking about is they're all very nice things that he did, but basically what, what it sounds like here. Uh, by by him, oh, I wanted to go to the to the to the black community, and I and I was a, an employee, uh, the only white employee in a in a in a black swimming pool in a black community or whatever, uh, and, you know, and that's how I started my political career. It kind of sounds like, uh, you know, in high school when you have to do community service, like they, we had to do community service in in my high school. And you kind of do the 30 hours community service just to get the credits so you can graduate. Right. Like, that's kind of what this sounds like to me. He's like, I went into the black communities because I knew that I would need the black vote. So, you know, there it is. Boom. Bing, bang, biggity, boom. Went there. We got the swimming pool. They looked at the hair thing. They said the corn pops and the record players and bam, black votes, baby. Black votes. <laughs> like, that's that's kind of what this sounds like. Right. Again, as Jay pointed out, it's disingenuous. It just doesn't come off as like an authentic experience to me. It comes off as like, hey, I went to black communities to build my resume. I didn't go to the black communities because I care about what's happening in black America. I care about what's happening in this uh, in these unseen communities, in these communities that are often looked over and often uh, criminally brutalized, I went there because I knew that I would be able to get votes and start my career in politics that way. It's very, very disingenuous. Uh, you know, it's just him trying to get reelected over and over again and continue his tenure in politics. That's what this sounds like to me. You know, that's, that's my, that's my view on this. And so, you know, when you take a look at my record, people talk about the crime bill. Crime bill didn't increase mass incarceration. Other things increase mass incarceration. And the reason why, if you go back and look, and I know you talk about it, you go back and take a look. That's why you had the vast majority of the black caucus at the time supporting the crime bill. Almost every major city black mayor supported the crime bill because blacks were getting killed overwhelmingly as well. And what happened when that crime bill? It had four or five really important things. It had the Violence Against Women Act. It said, drug court, don't send anybody who has a drug problem to jail. Send them to rehabilitation, to a drug court. It had in it, they had the, uh, the assault weapons ban, getting rid of assault weapons, getting rid of the, round, the number of rounds you could have in a gun. It also had in it a whole range of other things, but that things I didn't like. Clinton wanted to put in a deal where, in fact, three strikes and you're out. I opposed that three strikes and you're out bill. I oppose the position taken that saying that you're going to have any mandatory sentences. But on balance, the whole bill, what happened was it did, in fact, bring down violent crime in black communities as well. And guess what? The fact is prison population didn't increase. Ninety four percent of every prisoner in jail is in a state prison, not a federal prison, no federal law. 
And here's the deal. The one thing I opposed in that bill was people wanting to give money to state prisons to build more prisons. I opposed it. But the point was, on balance, everything from the assault women's ban to the violence against women ban to the drug courts, they were important. And now, look what we can do. Look, I've been pushing, along with my colleagues in a black caucus in the United States Congress, we should change the entire, and I've been doing this for a while, change the entire prison system from one that is punishment to rehabilitation. There's only a couple things everybody has in common in jail. One is they were <clears throat> the victims of abuse of their kids were, or, their, or, their, or, their, or their mother was. Number two, can't read. Number three, they don't have any job skills. They were in a position where they didn't get a chance. Why does it make sense? Why did I come along and write the first act that said, when you get out of prison, you don't just get a notion where you get 25 bucks and a bus ticket. You end up under the bridge. You end up under the bridge and just do the same place. So every single solitary person being released from prison should have access to every single government program. Why does it not make sense to have African-Americans who are getting out of prison, <coughs> who serve their time, everybody for that matter, be able to have public housing? Why doesn't it make sense that they can have Pell Grants to go to school? Why doesn't it make sense they can have access to health care? What are we, nuts? Okay, again, I, I want to point out that the words he is saying are not false. <laughs> like, we do need to change the prison system. I've talked about, uh, you know, the uh, various ways that we could change the prison system. I've done tons of videos about it. I've talked about it in my stand-up. Um, and and uh, not to pit myself, but it's just I don't want to keep going over the same points over and over again uh, and, and make this video super long. But here's the thing. The, the problem with what he just said is, uh, he overgeneralized like everybody in prisons. Like they come from a world of abuse. They're illiterate. They're unskilled workers who can't get a job once they get out. Like that's such a fucking crazy thing to say, right? Right now in prisons, we have former Black Panthers who are still in prison serving out like 100 year sentences for being a part of the Black Panthers. Not not for being, you know, not for being part of the, the the violent end of the Black Panthers, community organizers, right? COINTELPRO happened. Um, COINTELPRO ramped up, by the way, only because community initiatives were, were spreading around the country and uh, people were starting to realize that the federal government is not providing them with any help, but rather these community initiatives are going to be helpful uh, and and save and save communities, essentially. Anyway, that's a little aside. But, but these Black Panthers right now that are in prisons are fucking scholars. They're geniuses. Like, so they're 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 geniuses in in law. They're geniuses in organization. They're geniuses in economic theory, and they are currently in prison. So what Joe Biden is saying, where he's generalizing what prisoners are by saying that they're unskilled, they're illiterate, and they all come from a background of abuse, is total fucking bullshit. I'm not saying that there aren't people in prison who might be illiterate, who might have come from a background of abuse, who might not be able to do you know, um, basic jobs and things of that sort, there is probably a percentage of the prison population in that, in that category, but that's not everybody. Like that's, it's such a, a wildly inaccurate thing to say. So, uh, he talks about mass incarceration. This has been a, uh, a thorn in Joe Biden's side since he decided to run for president. Since I, I, I would say that it was probably a thorn in Joe Biden's side when he was uh, Obama's VP. Uh, is the is the issue of mass incarceration and the 1994 crime bill, which he brought up in this situation as well. So there's a bunch of different articles. The the main one that I uh, found uh, rather informative is from Mother Jones. Uh, which again is 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 a publication that I uh, wax and wane on. Some things I really like that they cover. Other things are very very uh, weirdly biased. Uh, they you know so uh, this one I felt like they did a pretty good job and it kind of you know looking at different sources they were hitting on some uh, on some good points. Actually, um, Jay Jay Jackson posted a, an a, an excellent article uh, that kind of breaks down a lot. Uh, of of Biden's policies and how they've how it's affected the black community from the Guardian. It's an excellently written article. Um, so 
one of the things that, that, uh, to, to point out here is uh, mass incarceration in America has been increasing pretty damn steadily since the 70s. Uh, and the 1994 crime bill didn't, did not stop that. It didn't decrease it in any way. Um, it might have decreased the rate at which mass incarceration was happening, but it did not actually stop mass incarceration. It did not do a significant decrease in it. Um, you know, and I think you could see that just in the last 10 years with, I mean, fuck, how many, how many videos do we see of innocent black people getting harassed and killed by the police? How many videos do we see of indigenous people getting killed and harassed by the police? Right. It's just like this, this shit is not slowing down. The 1994 crime bill did not slow any of that stuff down. So the other thing that he talked about is a bunch of states that uh, were on board. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, $12.5 billion were given to state prisons as long as they kept prisoners serving 85% of their sentences. 85% of the sentences. That's not rehabilitation, folks. Let's say somebody is in prison for 100 years. That means in order for that prison to keep getting money, they have to at least serve out 85 years of that, right? But let's say within 10 years, that prisoner has um, become become a, a model prisoner. You know, there there have been no um, no uh, you know bad behavior, no fights. They've kind of kept to their duty. They and and it feels like they've learned. They will still get denied parole because the states want to get that money. These state prisons want to get that money, so they get denied parole. This is not about rehabilitation. That's not rehabilitation. That is fucking profit. That's in the crime bill in 1994. That increases mass incarceration. That pushes people to create more laws that push more people into prison. When you incentivize this sort of shit. Um... Uh, the guy that was uh, in charge of the civil rights div division under President Obama uh, said that uh, that that this twelve point five billion dollar provision to to state prisons built up the prison population because it's the incentive. So what I just said, th it's been corroborated by somebody as part of the Obama administration that worked with Biden for uh, eight years. Now he did call the three strike. What he what he said about the three strike rule was true. He did oppose the three strike rule. Um, he went publicly and said it was wacko. Uh, that's a quote, and it, I, it's very believable that Joe Biden would use the word wacko, uh, even in 1994. Right? Uh, the the dude in <laughs> the tour bus was all about malarkey. Like that's. <laughs> Like, this is very, 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 very clear that he probably said this, right? Uh, what he did say was he wanted to get violent offenders in prison and get them off the street, which, again, is incongruent to him talking about rehabilitation. Uh, a video I did maybe about a year and a half ago talked about Brazil has a uh, has a prison system, or I, I rather had. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro is kind of an authoritarian dictator, I don't think this prison system is surviving, but it became this big thing um, for a while. And uh, it was a prison with no guards. The prisoners kept themselves in prison. Uh, they felt like they needed to serve their time and uh, reflect and better themselves to re-enter society and become functioning members. What did that mean? Um, that meant um, that they took tasks on, jobs, things of that sort, helped out the community, but would return back to prison walls. Uh, that's rehabilitation. And, uh, you know, they all kind of monitored each other. And the, and the harshest of them, these violent offenders that Joe Biden's talking about in Brazil, um, would do more indoor tasks at first. And then once they kind of felt more comfortable, would, would interact with uh, doing more publicly related tasks. That's rehabilitation. I mean, that's a very, very progressive notion of rehabilitation, where you are really a looking into the psychology of what caused somebody to get that violent. Uh, saying you want them off the streets and to be put into a prison for profit system, well, you know, we're, we're not getting rid of the violence in our society. 
uh, putting putting laws that that take you know small drug offenders and put them in the same prison cell as a violent offenders uh, it makes it very difficult to say that it's about rehabilitation. So you know I, there's some incongruity with, within what what he's saying here. the The problem with the prison system that that I see is that it is profit driven. It is a profit driven system that is marketed as a vindictive vengeful way to incur God's wrath on a mortal plane. That's kind of what this prison system is, right? You will incur God's wrath on a mortal plane. And, and the 1994 crime bill that Joe Biden helped pass is basically helped that happen, help push that happen. Uh, all right, we're going to do one more clip and then I'm going to look at some comments and then we'll, we'll get to the end of this video. And the, here we go. I, I, As we keep doing. So, yeah, so I, sorry, that's uh, that's. Oh shit! Sorry, time there. there. No, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I know Jill has to use this, but I, I want. I've talked too much. I apologize. No, let me. I got. I got to ask you though. You know? <laughs> I like how they were just like, okay, Joe, uh, Joe Biden just said something against Queen Hillary, and you can't, uh, you, you can't do that, <laughs> right? Like black media just touched a nerve about Joe Biden's record, and they were just like, we gotta cut. Cut the interview. You can't say anything about Queen Hillary or bring up the fact that uh, Joe Biden actually did a lot of bad things to black people uh, with his crime bill that he's very proud of. Okay, every, just can we just uh, shut it down? <laughs> I don't know who that guy is, but uh, that was uh, very entertaining. Um, I'm, I'm going to look at some comments before. Uh, here we go. Uh, I was gonna. I thought. I honestly did th think that he was gonna tell the corn pop story, Jay. I did too. I, I really did. <laughs> uh, for the oh, thank you for posting the article. The, Jay posted the article. Uh, also, thank you for the shout outs. Appreciate you. Keep up the good fight. Hell yeah! I'm 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 glad you watch these videos, man. It makes it more fun when you're when you're in here. Uh, what a train wreck, indeed. And it's it, it only gets worse. Uh, if you look at his voting record, uh, Biden is way right. He is. Uh, he he has a lot of far right ideologies, and I mean, that's that's sort of what neoliberalism is. Um, to to some degree, neoliberalism, uh, and this is not the abject definition of neoliberalism. This is an aspect of neoliberalism. Is essentially to present these d sort of. It's basically to present conservative ideas. Uh, using very nice words uh, and speaking compassionately while you're taking rights away from people and while you're trying to monetize on people's identities. The, that's sort of what neoliberalism does. Uh, and Joe Biden is, is an excellent example of that. He is a Democrat that preaches himself to be on the side of the working class. He preaches himself to be a man of the people. And then he essentially puts legislation in place to ensure that, that these people will end up in prison. Uh, and then they'll stay in prison because the prisons get to make money. And because he supported these for-profit prisons, he gets to make money as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think he's sort of the, um, the, de the definition of that. And his voting record does line up more with, uh, with Republicanism. Oh, I, maybe it lines up a little bit more with um, uh, Republicanism in, in like the 60s and 70s than it does now because i think the republican party has moved way way further to the right and and we do have to give uh bill clinton some credit for moving the democratic party away from center left into into full right um so yeah i think i think you're 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 correct there danny thank you for thank you for the comment i appreciate it all right now uh, let us continue forward with this video. We're gonna we're gonna uh, get all the way to the end because the end that's when the good stuff comes in, you guys. <laughs> you know why so much resistance on admitting the crime bill and, and other legislation you are a part of was damaging to the black community? Because we had Hillary on a few years ago, uh, and Ms. Ms. Clinton said that the crime bill made we made a lot of mistakes with that and she wanted to atone for that by becoming the next president like she was wrong what happened was it wasn't the crime bill it was the drug legislation it was the, inst the institution of mandatory minimums which i oppose mandatory i, thought, I oppose I thought, the you, I, thought you, I thought you create i thought you uh, was a part of that in 84 as well the comprehensive crime control act 
that established mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses. No, no. What happened was, you're, what you're confusing is, what, what happened was, the Black Caucus came to me and said, look, one of the, well, I did this study when I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee. We looked at every district of the, <coughs> of, the, of the 10 court districts in America, federal court districts, and we found out that if you got arrested for robbery and convicted, and I got arrested for robbery and convicted, it was the first time, you went to jail an average of 13 years, I went to jail an average of three years. So there was this whole move, same time for the same crime. So no one based on their color could go to jail longer than anybody else for the same crime. So what happened was there was a judicial selection committee setting up that how you deal with making sure that the sentencing process is taken out of the hands of a prosecutor saying, I'm going to want 12 years, 13 years for you, and three years for me. The end result of that was the unintended consequence, which we changed, Barack and I did, was the fact that you, in fact, all of a sudden, you could not lower my sentence or your sentence be uh, lower than what was the average sentence for everybody else going to jail in the districts. That's how that came about. It didn't say mandatory. We said to the judges, you can't send people to jail for the same crime different times. They have to be within a, 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 a framework. That's why that has been changed. And while I was vice president, I helped Barack, we reduced the prison population federally by 38,000 people. 38,000 people. And the only, the only mandatory was in there was carjacking, which I opposed, and three strikes and you're out, which is ridiculous. It only was imposed three times. But still, even once makes no sense. The idea of three ties, three strikes and you're out. Give me a break. And the other thing we have to do, one of the things that, you know, I was a public defender. I'm going to insist when I'm president that a public defender gets, a federal public defender gets paid the same amount of money as a federal prosecutor gets paid. So you have representation. People have representation. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, I, I, I sure do hope that public defenders get paid better. Um, here's the biggest thing is he's going, I mean, he's really going after Queen Hillary here. Like, like the DNC is probably fucking pissed. Uh, so let's look at some of the things that, that he brought up, right? 1984, Charlemagne talked about the 1984 Comprehensive Crime Control Act. He, he, it added, it definitely added mandatory minimums and it abolished federal parole. That was the 1984 crime control, um, Crime Control Act that Joe Biden was a part of uh, kept people in prison longer, and there was no, there was no, no fucking incentive to rehabilitate. Right? Then we go forward. Nineteen eighty six. There were harsher sentences uh, for crack cocaine than cocaine, which meant that they were targeting Black Americans. Uh, cr crack cocaine was a drug that was prevalent within the Black communities. Uh, cocaine was primarily a white drug in the eighties, and People got harsher sentences for crack cocaine, despite the fact that crack cocaine and cocaine, virtually the same thing. Um, I'm not an expert on doing these drugs, but from what I've read about them, not a lot of fucking difference. But there you go, right? W where was where was the thing? It's called crack cocaine. Oh, it's got so we got to make it harsher because that's in the black community and the regular cocaine. We can well, we can give these guys two to three years. You know, give 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 the crack cocaine people fifteen to twenty years. So there you go. There there's another incongruity for you. In 1986, he pushed for harder sentences um, de depending on the color of your skin and the drug of your choice. Uh, 1993, he started changing his tune, but then the 1994 crime bill had a bunch more mandatory sentences uh, written in there. <laughs> he wrote more more legislation for mandatory sentences. So he's against mandatory sentences, but his flagship bill that he is so fucking proud of in 1994 that he that he basically represents himself by has the thing that he says he's against. Finally, in 2010, he reduced sentencing for uh, crack cocaine offenses. Great. So, I mean, only about 30 years too late, 
right? After the damage was done to to the black community at that point, you know. So I mean, to the people that are thinking that you can push Biden over to the left, you you probably can in in, in about thirty years if he gets to be about thirty. He's seventy seven, so by the time he's a hundred and seven. He'll be a little bit over to the left. <clears throat> Excuse me. After millions and millions of people have gone to prison and have possibly died there. This dude's not moving anywhere to the left. <clears throat> All right. Let us let us continue. But the bottom line is the other piece is I'm going to try to change and I've laid it out. I'll send you a copy of my plan. So you have it. To see it. voice. Pardon me? What, deliver every voice or what? No, the one that I, the plan I have is my manifesto for black America. Ooh, oh God. Uh, as a, as an older white dude, you shouldn't say that you have a manifesto for black America. Oh my God, that's not good. Oh, that, oh, you should, you should very much rethink that, that phrase. You have a man, nobody that's ever written a manifesto for black America has ever been like, here's my manifesto to help black America as an old white dude. It's always just like, here's my manifesto for why black America needs to go down. Like that's always, this, that's a bad, whoo, not, not a good look. Not a good look, Joey B. <laughs> not a good look. Oh man. All right. But this is, this is going to be a little bit, uh, one of the longer ones too. And a span, particularly the portion of it, that relates to how, in fact, we're going to deal with the prison system. If you are in prison, if you are convicted of a crime, no one should be going to jail for a drug crime, period. Nobody. Nobody. So, no so matter what the crime, particularly marijuana, which makes no sense for people to go to jail. They should be just wiped out completely. And the reason is that... But if anything, for those crimes that are actually continue to be crimes, scheduled crimes, as marijuana shouldn't be anymore, what is happening is you shouldn't go to prison. You should go to a, a mandatory rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. It costs less to put people in a drug rehabilitation program than it does in jail. And you have a chance. we got to give people a chance. Well, you know, Vice President Biden, I've read some of your black agenda, and you say that you would decriminalize marijuana. What's the difference between legalizing it and decriminalizing it? Because they're trying to find out whether or not there is any impact on the use of marijuana, not in leading you to other drugs, but what it affects, does it affect long-term development of the brain? And we should wait till the studies are done. Uh, well, that's a fucking horseshit argument because there's been studies that have been done about that forever. We have CBD, THC, and other cannabinoid receptors in our brains, and we have seen a lot more positive effects of, um, of marijuana and hemp in medical use than negative ones. Uh, I did an interview. I'm friends with uh, Patrick and Teresa Nightingale of the Pittsburgh Normal, N-O-R-M-L, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And they talk about this exact thing that I just brought up. That's that's actually where I learned a lot of the information. It's a fantastic podcast. Uh, I, I recommend uh, you guys go check it out if you have the time. Uh, Taboo Table Talk, uh, I, it probably came out about a month or two ago uh, is when I released the episode. But it is a fantastic conversation where they basically debunk this bullshit argument that's being presented here, right? Oh, we should decriminalize it, which just basically means if you get caught with marijuana, you do the same thing. You get to go. You you get to go to rehab. You have to go to rehab for a plant. Could you? There's no fucking plant that you need to go to a rehab for. Could you imagine if 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 that went through and they went to a community garden and looked at somebody? that was planting some fucking rutabagas and was just like, hey, look, it looks like you got a problem. There's a bunch of these rutabagas all over all, uh, all over this garden over here, and we got to send you to rehab for putting this plant in the ground. Seems like you have a problem. Seems like you have a real big rutabaga problem over here. It's, it's such an outrageous fucking uh, thought process. We've had research done from the scientific community about this exact thing that he's talking about. He just doesn't want to legalize it uh, federally 
because that means that he would lose money from the pharmaceutical industry and the health insurance industry. What she doesn't want to do. Here's the thing. I think if you've never smoked weed or taken edibles, which I, I don't know if Joe Biden ever has smoked weed or taken edibles, uh, there's a chance. I'm, uh, we got to do the studies to figure this out. Is If you have never smoked weed, there's a chance uh, that millions and millions of people will watch your brain fall out of your head on national television uh, all the time. We got to do the studies. Science, as Joe Biden is about to say, I think science matters. I think we got decade. I think we got decades and decades of studies from actual weed smokers, though. Yeah, I do. I know a lot of weed smokers. <laughs> dude, I do. I do not think Joe Biden understood what Charlemagne just fucking said there. I don't think he understood the joke that Charlemagne was making. Uh, right, which is again, also, I know a lot of very intelligent weed smokers. I know a lot of productive weed smokers. Um, uh, it's great. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm endorsing. Uh, I don't know. It's your choice. You do what you want with it. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think it's fine. Uh, <laughs> I totally don't fucking think he understood that joke. I, I love that face. Again, not to brag, but that's a fucking great still. Isn't it? Soak that one in, baby. Soak that one in. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed it, uh, please give it a like and please subscribe to my channel for uh, for more. There's going to be daily videos going up uh, on this channel. Uh, I am also uh, going to be performing virtual live stand-up comedy shows via Zoom. Uh, I've done a couple of these and they've been super, super fun. So thank you to all the people that have already purchased tickets and uh, come out to these shows on a regular basis. They're, they're pretty fun. I'm going to be doing them every single Friday in the month of June. Tickets are available for those right now on my website at krishmohan.com. So that's June 5th, June 12th, June 19th, and June 26th going at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific uh, if you're in the other time zones. I think you can figure out what what time that <laughs> these shows are going to be on. Uh, they are going to be each show is going to be a little bit different. They're going to be covering topics like the one uh, in the video that you just watched. Uh, again, you can grab your tickets at krishmohan.com. It's K R I S H M O H A N every Friday at June 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and uh, if you are a sustaining member, you get a free ticket to every single one of these shows. Uh, and you can become a sustaining member over uh, on my website as well. And uh, I know P I know times are tough, uh, so if you are in a financially precarious situation, please send me a message uh, or an email, and I will happily give you a code that will get you a, uh, a free ticket to attend these shows. Uh, I'm also releasing my brand new stand-up comedy album, which if you're a sustaining member, you get an early uh, early release version of, early uh, early copy of. Uh, it is available on my Bandcamp page to pre-order right now, and it comes out June 1st. So you can go to ramennoodlescomedy.bandcamp.com, get, uh, get your copy of it uh, for only a dollar. You can pre-order it for only a buck. If you want to donate a little bit more, that would be awesome as well. Uh, there are more videos like this coming up. I'm, I'm going to be doing uh, a bunch of live streams pretty regularly from my Facebook page and uploading and releasing videos via the YouTubes and uh, and the, on the audio podcast versions as well. So stay tuned. Make sure that you like, make sure that you share, and make sure that you're subscribed to these pages because content like this often gets uh, gets suppressed. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much for hanging out. And uh, till the next one, we'll see you on the road. Thanks.